Chapter 3 Wakey, wakey, number 11, a sing-song voice whispered softly accompanied by a gentle bouncing sensation. Although my eyes were shut, I could sense that number 3 was sitting on the edge of my bed grinning. I felt my mouth crack into a tired smile as I tried fruitlessly to lift my heavy eyelids. Five more minutes, I sighed sleepily before letting my eyelids fall again. Come on, number 11, number 3 said, giving me a light shove. The sooner we can get going, the sooner we can meet with Pearl. Taxi gets here in 15 minutes. It took a few seconds for my mind to register what number 3 had just said. The next thing I knew, my eyes sprang open painfully, allowing the bright morning sunlight from the window to flood into them. Without warning, I sat up with such vigor that number 3 nearly fell off of the bed. Glancing at the clock, I saw that it was 45 minutes after 7. 15 minutes! I gasped, then chided playfully, Good heavens, number 3, why didn't you wake me earlier? I seized my glasses from the drawer beside my bed and put them on before grabbing my toothbrush. I've got to look my best, I said as I brushed my teeth. After taking a quick shower, I got dressed, grabbed my rolling bag, and followed number 3 out of my apartment and down the dimly lit hallway towards the elevator. The taxi should be downstairs right this moment, said number 3 excitedly as we reached the elevator. He illuminated the down button with his finger. With a soft ding, the door slid open and we stepped inside to descend to the bottom floor. Through the glass double doors of the lobby, I could see the taxi cab parked outside. Number 3 ran ahead and held the door so that I could make my way through it with my bag before following me out into the bright, cool morning parking lot. Wheeling my bag around towards the back of the cab, I wrapped on the trunk lightly before it popped open slightly. I lifted the trunk open and heaved my bag into it before going to join number 3 in the back seat of the car. Take us to the airport, please, number 3 said to the driver. The driver nodded and soon the car pulled out of the parking lot onto the highway. As we stopped at a traffic light, number 3 asked if it was okay if we listened to the radio. The driver said yes and twiddled a knob on the dashboard, causing the sound of white noise to fill the cab. The light turned green and the driver pressed the scan button, causing the radio to alternate between a variety of talk shows, songs, and commercials. Wait, stop, stop, number 3 said, waving his hand frantically. I think I like this song. The driver had to backtrack a few stations before reaching the station number 3 requested. The song was an upbeat song played with a variety of string and percussion instruments. Amidst the instruments was a foreign vocalist accompanied by a rapper rapping about ending war. Number three listened momentarily before beginning to snap, clap, and sway along with the music. Yup, he said. Love it. I smiled as I watched number three. This music is addictive, isn't it? I said. Tell me about it, said number three. Once it gets you going, it's extremely hard to stop. About an hour later, the cab pulled over to an exit ramp which circled around and merged into a passage leading to the airport terminals. I've got to look up that song when we get back home so I can listen to it, said number three as we stepped out of the cab and I went to grab my bag from the trunk. As I followed number three inside, a thought hit me like a stone. I just realized, I said, I don't really know where we're going. I do, said number three. I should buy the tickets. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a credit card, which he handed to the ticket clerk. Could we get two tickets to Marengo City? The ticket clerk nodded and swiped number three's card through a machine before handing it back to him. That name sounds familiar, I said. Technically, the city doesn't exist, said number three. It's a part of my universe. That's why I had to get the tickets. If you had asked, then you'd have been laughed at. We went through security with no trouble. As we reached a crowded gate where passengers were waiting to travel, number three pointed at a high def screen registering the different departures and arrivals. So, I said, which gate do we need to go to? Wait for it, said number three. Bingo! As I watched, the name Marengo City appeared on the board along with the information. Did you see that? I asked. Of course I did, said number three. Now, let's hurry up and find our gate so that we can eat. Soon, we were making our way through bustling clouds, fluorescent light corridors from one terminal to another. Finally, we reached our terminal, which was really crowded. A flashing marquee overhead read, Marengo City. Are these people aware that they're traveling to a town that doesn't exist? I asked. Not at all, said number three. I wouldn't bother trying to explain this to them either. They'll think I've gone crazy if I try. For breakfast, number three and I bought two cheddar cheese bagels with eggs and bacon, and two cappuccinos from a pastry cafe. 
We seated ourselves on the chairs at the gate while waiting to board our flight. So, I said, what's Pearl like? Number three swallowed the bite of bagel he had taken and wiped his mouth with a napkin and spoke. She's really sweet, funny, and smart. How did you two meet, I asked. At a costume party, number three replied. She told me that she knew TJ and that I was an alter ego. Wow, I said curiously. So are you two... Oh no, it's not like that, said number three, scratching his head. We're not dating. She's more like a sister to me, really. It's nice to have someone to talk to about things going on between TJ and myself in regards to Cheryl or, you know, Kristen. Oh, I said, biting my lip. Something inside me stirred. Soon our flight began to board. I glanced at my ticket before asking which seat number three would be sitting in. Oh no, we won't be sitting together on the plane, I said, disappointed. Don't worry, number eleven, said number three. I'll see you when we land. I guess it's okay, I sighed. Planes make me sleepy anyway. Waving to number three, I grabbed my bag and wheeled it down the passageway leading to the cabin of the plane. Carefully making my way through the other passengers boarding the plane, I found my seat. After heaving my bag into the overhead compartment and closing it with a snap, I sat down in my seat, which was next to a window behind the left wing. A man with a bushy brown mustache shuffled into the seat next to mine. I glanced at him momentarily before gazing out of the window of the plane again. About thirty minutes later, the pilot announced that we'd soon be departing. I continued to stare out of the window as the plane pushed back from the gate and began to taxi onto the runway. I began to drift off before the roaring of the engines woke me with a start as our plane sped along the runway and lifted into the air to fly above the clouds. Within seconds, I drifted into a deep sleep. The cabin of the plane jolted and shivered violently, shaking me awake hours later. The radio crackled and the raspy voice of the pilot announced that we would be landing in Marengo City in 30 minutes. Half an hour later, as I felt the slightly uneasy tilt of the plane's descent, I peered out of the window at the landscape whizzing by under my feet. The gleaming jewel-like buildings of the city seemed to glow a variety of different colors in the afternoon light. Beyond the cityscape, the ocean glittered like a bright turquoise mass. The clouds hung over in large swirly puffs painted against the misty blue sky. I heard a snore from on my right. I turned my gaze to look at the passenger next to me and gasped in shock at what I saw. The facial features of the man sitting next to me seemed to have been exaggerated. His eyebrows and bushy mustache seemed to have been made of clay. His skin suddenly took on a smooth plastic look as if he had been generated in a 3D modeling computer program. For one crazy moment, I was compelled to touch the passenger sitting next to me. I stopped myself thinking about how mad I'd be if some stranger would have poked me awake from a deep sleep. I lifted my hand and looked at it. It didn't seem to have taken on the animated qualities of the passenger sitting next to me. Shutting my eyes tightly, I began to feel my heart pumping ferociously as my insides began to feel lighter than air. As the plane touched down onto the runway and slowed down to taxi up to the gate, I kept my eyes shut, waiting for the plane to pull into the terminal. When the bell sounded signaling that the plane had come to a halt, I stood shakily. My insides were still bursting with excitement. As people clambered by with their luggage, I snapped open the overhead compartment, seized my bag shakily, and set it down on the floor. Stumbling through the crowd of people who resembled plastic dolls and clay sculpted caricatures, I made my way through the passageway off of the plane to find number three waiting for me. Number three had also appeared not to have adapted the stylized look of the world around him. His countenance, however, seemed to perfectly reflect the atmosphere of the place. Well, number eleven, said number three as he brightly spread his arms. Welcome to Marengo City. I looked around in awe at my surroundings. This airport was fancier and more cathedral-like than the one from which I had departed. Stained glass chandeliers hung from the ceilings, casting light onto the floor, which was covered with carpets bearing a starry night pattern. Come check this out, number eleven, said number three, grabbing my hand and leading me to one of the men's restrooms along the corridors. He gestured at one of the mirrors and said in a sing-song voice, Looky, looky! I stared at the reflection of number three and myself, which took on the stylized look of the people around us. I reached out gingerly and put my hand against the mirror. This is so weird! I exclaimed. What movies are we in right now? Cheerberry Animations, Ring Dings, Winkley's Maroon, and Magic Puppet House by Harmony Animation, said number three, his eyes twinkling. 
Right now, TJ and his siblings could be watching us through a magic box in their home. I know, I said, tears of joy and excitement forming in my eyes. I'm a Winkly character. I'm a Winkly character! My prayers have been answered. In this world, people don't pray, said number three. They wish. At this, we both burst into fits of laughter. The last time I had laughed this hard was when our sister Keita poked fun at our sister Colette, saying her head was like a dinner plate because she saw peas everywhere. It was in moments like these where my TJ characteristics gained a new perspective of how much fun TJ's feeling for Cheryl could be. Come on, number 11, said number 3, leading me through the bustling airport towards ground transportation. Outside of the front entrances to the airport terminals, the taxi came whizzing by, stopping suddenly next to the curb where number 3 and I stood waiting. This cab was a bit smaller than the last one number 3 and I had ridden in. It had a plastic look like a toy car, yet it sounded very realistic and it emitted the faint smell of exhaust like a real vehicle. Although this cab had less trunk space than the last one, number 3 and I still managed to squeeze my bag into it. No sooner had I joined number 3 in the back seat of the taxi, we were off, speeding out of the airport parking lot towards the highway. This car feels like it's going too fast, I said, peering through the window watching the cityscape whiz by. That's because you're in a world animated by some brilliant minds over in Burbank, Glendale, and Emeryville, California, said number three. Wait until we leave town. It was as our car pulled over onto a narrowing road leading to a sloping hill that I saw what number three was talking about. The two-lane road winded, curved, sloped, rose, and fell as it moved through the countryside. The taxi rumbled as it whizzed along. I grabbed the seat and clutched it tightly for dear life. Number three chuckled with amusement, watching me. It's more fun when you put your hands up, he said, throwing his hands in the air. No thanks, I said. Are you wearing a seatbelt? Of course I am, said number three, plucking at the strap across his chest. Safety first, you know. The taxi rounded a series of curves, sped through stone tunnels before leveling out and slowing down. Passing under a stone archway, the taxi bumped over a cobblestone road that was lined with small, two-story Tuscan-styled houses. In the front yards of the houses, children could be seen playing with toys or objects they had found outdoors such as rocks or sticks. Everglade Island, said number three brightly, this is the location where Ring Dings takes place. The path led out of the village and into a colorful painted forest of fancy looking trees and various plants which glittered in the yellowish glow of the sunlight streaming through the trees. Finally, we emerged in a neighborhood of what resembled brightly colored life-size toy houses Victorian style. They were perched on grassy hills on either side of the street. The taxi pulled to a halt at the foot of the hill where a concrete pathway led up to a blue two-story house with a wide front porch. Stepping out of the taxi, I began to take in the sight and sounds around me. The chirping of seagulls, the roar of the ocean crashing onto the shore, the joyful shouts and laughter of children playing on the hills in front of their houses, and the faint sound of steel drum music. Unloading my luggage from the trunk of the taxi, I began to follow number three along the concrete pathway onto the porch of his house. Number eleven, said number three, extracting the key from his pocket and inserting it into the lock on the front door. Welcome to my home. He turned the key with a click withdrew it, and then pushed the door open. Following number three across the threshold, I stepped into a room which resembled the inside of a palace. Ocean-themed decorations adorned the walls, fish, seahorses, seashells, waves, and palm trees. A golden glittering chandelier hung from the ceiling, giving the living room a soft yellowish glow. Art hung on the walls of the living room. I gazed at a couple of paintings, realizing they looked quite familiar. Is that our mom's art? I asked. Yeah, I bought some of her stuff, said number three. Come with me. I want to show you my room. Leaving my shoes in my bag next to the door, I followed number three up a curved flight of steps leading to a balcony overlooking the living room. Number three grasped the knob of a door and pushing it open, he led me through it. I call this place Cheryl Land, said number three. Looking around, I could see small statues of Cheryl perched on drawers and shelves. Several more paintings which number three stated he had done himself depicted Cheryl as his son, TJ's heart as a seed, and number three as a plant growing from it. Over the headboard of number three's bed hung a relief sculpture of Cheryl with the heart-shaped frame in the background. To remind me of why I'm here, 
said number three, gazing at the painting with a dreamy sort of reverence. He then turned to face the door. Gesturing at it, he said, And then, there's the rest of who I am. I turned and looked. I felt the buzz of excitement as I stared. The wall surrounding the door leading out of the room was dedicated to other things. A picture of TJ with his family hung to one side of the door along with several more paintings by our mom in number three. Other pictures showed nine-pointed stars, gardens in Haifa, a golden-topped Israeli circular temple, a famous Arabic insignia known as the greatest name, and over the door, a picture of a Persian man with a white beard wearing a turban. I love this room, I said. I only have one picture of Kristen on my wall and one on my computer. No paintings? said number three. Nope, I replied. I'll work on that later, though. Come on, said number three, ushering me out of the room. I have something else to show you, and then I'll introduce you to Pearl. I followed number three around the corner to another upstairs room. The muffled sound of chattering and electronic bass music issued from behind the door. Number three opened the door, and the sounds inside the large room became clearer. The flashing glow of multicolored lights met our eyes. Silhouettes danced on the walls against dots of light whizzing by. Strings of Christmas lights hung from the ceiling. Tiny fancy houses of various styles from old to futuristic were perched on shelves along with landscape and cityscape dioramas along the walls around the room. These buildings were apparently the homes of various figures parading about the room. There were puppets ranging from robots, space aliens, dinosaurs, and oddly shaped humans. This is my inspiration room, said number three. As I stepped cautiously into the room, a flashing object flew straight at my head, beeping as it came. I ducked instinctively, and the object hit the wall and fell to the floor with a bump. Curiously, I picked it up and examined it. A closer look showed me that the object was a flying saucer of some sort. It began to vibrate in my hand. Startled, I let it go, allowing it to fly, flashing and beeping back into the room. The room suddenly went quiet as number three and I entered. Then the squeaky girl voice squealed in excitement, TJ is home! Loud cheering erupted from the occupants in the room as the music started up again. The squeaky voice turned out to belong to a pink female horse sock puppet with a purple back, golden wings, and a long silver horn on her head. It seemed as though she were being operated by an invisible hand. In her left hoof, she held a stick with a five-pointed star on the end of it. The star had two eyes, a nose, rosy cheeks, and a pair of pink smiling lips. Dipper, Trixie, said number three brightly. Good to see you guys. Still holding the talking magic wand, the pink unicorn fluttered down from a shelf, scuttled across the table, and jumped up to embrace number three. Number three whirled excitedly as he returned the hug. He then drew them back so that the unicorn was now perched upright on the palms of his outstretched hands. Hey, Dipper, Trixie, said number three, meet my cousin BJ. Nice to meet you, I said, waving my hand tentatively. I'm Dipper, said the unicorn, whirling around to face me. And I'm Trixie, said the talking one. Aren't you going to play with us? Well, I replied. We will later, said number three. For now, we're just passing through. Now, Dipper, tell me, is Pearl back yet? Yeah, said Dipper. She's in her room. I think she fell asleep. Thanks, Dipper, number three said. Come on, BJ. As Dipper fluttered back up onto his shelf, number three ushered for me to follow him out of the room. BJ, huh? I said, giving number three an amused look as I followed him to Pearl's room. Tell me, number three, why do you get to be TJ? Number three shrugged. Because I'm awesome? He replied, grinning at me mischievously. Besides... When we talk with Pearl, we'll be able to figure out a way to explain to them who we really are. Those puppets usually hide the fact that they're alive from humans, I said. How'd you get them to talk to you? Easy, really, number three replied. After I bought them from the store, I bought a DVD at the Magic Puppet House to basically let them know that I knew their secret and that I was cool with it. Here we are. Number three knocked on another door and called through it. Pearl, I'm back. Okay. A soft, sweet, melodious, feminine voice answered from the other side of the door. After a few seconds, the knob of the door turned with a click and the door slowly began to open. I suppose that I expected to see a human of some sort. 
What I didn't expect to see was a pale white hand wearing hot pink fingernail polish clutching the door handle. As the door swung open wider, the full figure stepped into view. Her bodily features included a wide pair of hips, a small waist, and a bust which made her look as though she was smuggling two large coconuts. However, many of her features were unnatural. The skin on her limbs was pale white from her hands and feet all the way up to her forearms and calf muscles, which faded to light green, yellow, orange, and then a strawberry pink. Her face was minty blue and mask-like, resembling two slanted hearts pressed together. Her eyelids were like pink rose petals, and her lips were a bright candy apple red. Her entire body seemed to be spangled with stars that sparkled like diamonds. She wore a pair of dark blue denim shorts, a short-sleeved white cotton shirt, and a grin. She threw out her arms and embraced number three. I scratched my head as I felt the stirring sensation within, causing my breath to catch in my chest. Pearl, said number three, drawing away from Pearl and gesturing my direction. Meet number eleven. It's so good to finally see you, Pearl said, holding out her hand. Good to see you too, I said, gingerly taking her hand and shaking it. A faint fruity scent filled the air, causing my heart to race ferociously. Pearl let go of my hand and motioned for us to follow her to another room. In an upstairs den, Pearl sat on an armchair across from a sofa where number three and I parked ourselves. So, Pearl, I said, what animated film did you come from? Me? Pearl asked, giving me a bright, mysterious grin. I was sent here by TJ himself. I am one of his characters. I looked at number three in shock. Wait a minute, I said. I thought only fully developed characters lived in the Cineverse. They do, Pearl said. You seem pretty well established for a character created by TJ, I said. Not saying anything against TJ or anything, I'm just curious as to how TJ managed to get you so well developed. I blushed. I mean, how did TJ bring you to life? I can answer that question, Pearl replied, but it'll be too much for you to absorb all at once. If you help TJ, I can reveal it to you over time. I continued to gaze at Pearl. Her eyes met mine. I quickly glanced over at number three who shrugged. Now, Pearl said, I have a question for you guys. Has anyone of you talked to TJ lately about Kristen or Cheryl? Number three and I exchanged looks and shook our heads. No, not really, said number three. The last time I met with TJ, it was before I brought number three to my Cineverse, I said. Does TJ have any particular plans of how he's going to win over Kristen and Cheryl? Pearl asked. Well, your parents love you and, uh, never mind, number three said, grinning at me snidely. Oh, shut up! I snapped, playfully walloping number three with a couch pillow. Pearl giggled as I continued to give a now chuckling number three a playful scowl. Seriously now, Pearl said as we collected ourselves. I scratched my head, thinking for a moment, and then it hit me. Kristen's birthday is coming up in the summer, I said. Maybe TJ can get her a gift of some sort. Does TJ have anything in mind? Pearl asked. It has to be something personal because some DVD is not going to cut it. Dang it, I said. A book, maybe? suggested number three, shrugging and looking at me. Girls like books? Hey, that might be a good idea, I said, turning to number three. But who will we get the book for? Cheryl's birthday is not until near the end of the summer. Pearl cleared her throat loudly, stood up, and began pacing. Let me make a suggestion, she said. First of all, maybe TJ doesn't have to get Kristen anything for her birthday, nor Cheryl. Secondly, TJ technically isn't supposed to know Kristen or Cheryl's birthdays without them having told him. Getting them presents just might make TJ come off as some kind of stalker. What do you suggest? I asked. Pearl paused in the middle of her pacing to survey number three and I. You two should prepare some kind of artistic performance for both Kristen and Cheryl. What? I felt my breath catch in my chest. The next thing I knew, I had a vision of Kristen and Cheryl sitting in an auditorium among a group of faceless strangers. They were watching number three and I, who were frozen on the stage with terror. Boo! Cheryl yelled amidst the protesting shouts of the crowd. Worst performance ever! Kristen chimed in. The next thing I knew, number three and I were being dunked into a large tank of water by two large hands. As we thrashed about trying to free ourselves, water began to fill our lungs slowly and painfully. I shook my head vigorously, returning my thoughts to the den with Pearl, who was now sitting cross-legged on a chair, 
with a happily grinning number three. What kind of performance are we talking about? I say almost grudgingly. Pearl grinned and shrugged. Anything from a story to a song about you and number three. It doesn't matter. Oh, no, 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 I said. I am not singing the Kristen and Cheryl. Can you imagine that? I suddenly began playing an invisible accordion as I wailed and rolled my eyes. Number three watched laughing. Pearl gave me a look and said calmly, Maybe something like that, but with dignity. Do you guys remember when TJ was a child when his friends came to visit and TJ would give them those wax alphabets according to the letters beginning their names? <laughs> yeah, I remember that, I said chuckling. I don't see how that'll work with Kristen or Cheryl, though. Hey, Kristen, here's this K. It's just like your name except without all the other six letters. Well, said Pearl, now that TJ is older and more mature, you guys can think of this performance you prepare for Kristen and Cheryl as a more modified, advanced version of what TJ used to do as a child with those wax alphabets. That actually sounds like it would be fun, number three said, grinning. I'd love to perform for Kristen and Cheryl. Okay, then, I said. Where do we begin? Consult with one another about it, Pearl said. And don't forget to talk to TJ every now and then. TJ looks up to you guys. He's counting on you to come through for him. It's getting late now, so I'm going to get some sleep. With that, she stood up and left the room, leaving a half-nervous and stiff, half-excited and grinning presence in her wake.